Come on, baby. There she comes, boy. The fishermen of Cornwall. For hundreds of years, they've worked some of the richest fishing grounds in the world. When you've got a, a nice bag of fish come up, I don't think there's a better feeling in the world, you know. There's fish! There's fish! It's a way of life handed down through generations. I'll be the youngest in the fleet. That's not a bad status to have, is it? Well, we start the day anyway. <laughs> Woman overboard! Oh, no! Now a sea change is coming, the biggest the industry has seen in 50 years. Fishing is the acid test of Brexit. Taking back control of our waters, a brighter future beckons. Yeah. It was either vote to stay in or vote to get out, wasn't it? Just get out, like. Beautiful. What's life really like, living and working in the wild west of Britain? Can I ask for a better office? One thing a youngster these days needs is steady money coming in, and fishing doesn't guarantee that. And what does the future hold for this fishing life? Bigger the boat, bigger the balls, mate. I am in a gambling mood today, yeah. When you're at sea, fine weather, and there's a bit of fish coming over the rail, there's no better job. There isn't a better job in the world. Yeah, yeah, we're good to go, I think. All right. 34 year old Ben George and crewmate Ian fish out of Senan Cove, about as far west in Cornwall as you can get. It's been a really stop-start year. I mean, we haven't done anything all winter, basically. So we're all very keen to get out and uh, get things started. Um, we sort of, uh, the way it's been recently, we've had two days at sea and then four or five days a week off. So it's, it's been really frustrating. Today, Senan Cove is home to just four small fishing boats. Ben's the latest in a long line of Georges to fish these waters. Well, there's a massive history of fishing from Sun and Cove. The Georges fished 200 years before I've come along and taken over the reins. The golden times are gone, I suppose, and, you know, it's quite nice listening to the older guys talk about days when they would go out for a few hours and fill the boat up and pull pots and there'd be crawfish coming in on top of the pots, riding them, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to hear those stories, but it's, Obviously frustrating at the same time when you compare it to what fishing is like now. Small boats like Ben's, under 10 metres, are the backbone of the British fishing fleet, three quarters of all the boats. But limited by their size and by the weather, they've been in decline for a generation. Ought to be something in here, surely. To survive, Ben must target high value fish. Today, he's going after lobster. After a slow start to the season, he's under pressure to land a decent catch. Not very good in that one. Happy with that? Yep. All right. Senan's exposed, but it does hold one advantage. This rugged coastline means there's no busy port for miles in either direction. The cove's boats have this place to themselves keeping the waters rich. Well, that's the theory. It's not going to pay the bills, is it? No. It should still be in bed. <laughs> in there or not? One in there. One. Another blinding day at the office. Yeah. It's not the start we wanted, no. No four or five strings there for, for very little, really. After six hours at sea, Ben and Ian have just five dozen lobsters for their efforts. Oh, hi, Chloe, all right? Yeah. Yeah, all good. We're just in, got 30 kilo of lobsters. And to make a bad day worse, today's prices are low. Looking like 13 pound a kilo today for today's fish. Um, a bit disappointing because it's fallen from 17, so but then we just got to take it on the chin. 
Britain has a poor appetite for lobster and crab. It's thought 80% of Cornwall shellfish is exported to Europe. We're vulnerable to the foreign market. It's completely out of our hands and uh, it's something we just have to put up with. But it, it is frustrating sometimes when you come in with fish and you think you've had a cracking day and, you, and then you hear, oh, the price has fallen by two or three quid because of what's going on in France or Spain or something like that. And you sometimes feel like tipping them back in the harbour and just going home. <laughs> His, his nose is like that because I, I busted that. My uncle, Ted, he was more of a father to me than my father was. He got me a job fishing. I fished Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and the guy gave me 50 quid. And I thought, oh, my God, I think I'd better go fishing. Go! Newlyn is just eight miles from Senan, but a world away. Its sheltered harbour has seen it become Cornwall's busiest fishing port, home to over 50 small boats. Newlyn's a good place to fish. I rock up whatever time I fancy going to sea. It's a case of same pontoon berth, in and out, in and out, away you go. Like Ben, Andrew's prime target is lobster. But they're not taking the bait here, either. Fishing is really slow. Well, I think it's because of the water temperature. And then the old guys say, oh, it's still early, but bloody hell, it's June in a minute. <clears throat> With the lobsters not finding the pots, Andrew has decided to use nets to target spider crabs. You've got to have nets, you've got to have pots, you've got to have lines, you've got to have everything. Because one minute there'll be fish here and then there isn't. So you think, oh, well, I can't survive just sitting around waiting for something that might not turn up. I've got to try something else. <laughs> There's the first spider crabs. Come Fine creatures. Net's only been down two days. It shouldn't be this tangled, really, but there we are. He's had a bit of fun. Just what you need, this is, when you've got arthritis in both hands. Andrew is a modern fish entrepreneur. By selling his catch direct to a single high-end fishmonger, he gets the best price for whatever he lands. Over the years, the middlemen have made a lot of money, like, you know, and I thought, well, now the way it is with modern technology, I can catch fish today, get it on Cornwall Transport by dinner time, and they're in Sue's shop for the next morning. That's a fine crab, beauty. A lot of people now want to know where the fish comes from and who caught it and how old is it and all this sort of stuff. Despite all the effort, spider crabs only make Andrew three quid a kilo, a quarter of the return on lobsters. There's no great financial gain with this, it's just a little bit of extra. Fishing is quite fickle at the minute as some of the boys are waiting for mackerel to turn up. Well. At the minute, there isn't a mackerel to be seen. The younger guys that are chasing a dollar will struggle if, for whatever reason, they don't turn up. If you look back over the years, I think mackerel for, for guys in a small boat fishing out of a cove has been the, the bread and butter, so to speak. It's obviously a migratory fish, but back in the 70s when I was a youngster, it was prolific, uh, but it's... it's chased from pillar to post all around, the, all around the oceans. Oh, yeah, we used to catch a lot of mackerel, hell of a lot of mackerel. It is quite hard down the cove. It would be a lot easier fishing in there or another harbour.
James has fished from Penberth for six years, his father, Michael, for over 50. Today, they are hauling strings of lobster pots they set to fish a few days ago. Got about 120 to pull the day. Hopefully, do the lot. Ah, oh, spiders. Spiders. Whole oh, spiders. We're looking for lobsters. Spiders are everywhere now. Scaring the lobsters away. Just four fishermen work out of Penberth. At 29, James is the youngest, 30 years younger than anyone else. I don't really know how long the cove will last as a fishing cove, because there doesn't seem to be that many people coming into fishing that are that young anymore. I'm probably one of the youngest around. I've been on holiday. At least 20 years, I think. I just don't want to go away. I've been to London three times. I don't ever want to go up there again. Didn't like the place. <coughs> I just like the peace and quiet. Yeah, nothing better than from birth. But the fishing could be better. This year, we haven't caught any fish, very, very little. We had a few marks from the last August, but they were all very, very small. Well, a lot of the, the old fishermen are gone. They're all getting older, apart from James. He's open to stay here, but the things get a bit rough, and he, uh, he'll be going to Newland. Ah, uh, we see. Hope not. With Newland just around the corner, James and Michael have to share their fishing grounds with bigger boats. He's coming this way, isn't he? Slowly, look. Lovely boat, beautiful boat. You ain't catching very much. Nah. Uh, I haven't seen the fish go to the side of you. No. Nope. Oh, you weren't catching anything there. They don't normally come in this close. They normally stay outside there. But. Perhaps there's no fish outside either. They're all coming in the warm water. He must have just missed these pots. Yeah. There's a lobster. Ah, got one. Yay. This is the first one. <laughs> there's a lobster in there. Big lobster in there. A lovely lobster in there. Two with a few of these. No lobsters, are. Huh? We'll waste of time, these are. I couldn't work out of a cove. I don't know what cove mentality is, really. But, yeah, I tend to look after my boat and like it, no scratches, whereas the rough and ready boys in Pemberth is just, yeah, beat the boat up the pontoon and winch it up. Uh, no, I like everything nice <laughs> and not beaten up. Yeah, the cove is very important to me. I've grown up there all my life. And I hope to have a good season and keep proving as much as anything else that there's still fish out there around the cove and you can still keep doing it. And that seems to keep me going and Dad going as well. There'll be a space park in his premium outside Sue shop. There we go, all out. So it's not too bad in there at the minute. To mark the beginning of each lobster season, Andrew visits his only customer, Sue Lucas, to help her promote his catch. Morning. Morning. Hello. 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 <laughs> I'm good. Nice to see you. Okay. Your adoring fans have been in since 7.30. When it's full on, I'm usually in the way. You're but... never in the way. Oh, I don't know. You need to get yourself out there. Yeah, I will go out there. Oh. What have you got? 
What have I got? I've got some Pollocks today. Are these oh, yeah. all Pollocks? No, 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 not today. Often it will say these are Angie's Pollocks or whatever it is. Yeah, because yeah, Sue, Sue does sail close to the wind sometimes going on about my Pollocks. Yeah. He doesn't hold back on his the way he speaks, and they like that. I mean, I, I think our customers are very worldly wise and they understand you know he's a cornish fisherman you know he's not going to be coming up here all airs and graces and he tells it like it like it is he really does it must be nice to be warm <laughs> well i don't know are you not warm no i'm saying rather than be out on your boat like cornwall the Surrey Heath constituency also voted for Brexit. I think when we come out of the EU, the fishing stock will just get bigger and we can bring more of our own fish in. I don't know. I don't know where it's going to go. It's going to be a minefield. I think it is as well. So I was talking to one of the guys the other day. He was allowed to catch a tonne of Dover sole a month off the north, north coast of Cornwall. Yep. And there was a Dutch equivalent, and he's allowed to catch 10 tonne a month. If they were allowed to catch five or six tonne each, surely that's a, a level, fairer, pl level playing field. Yep. Do you think you can manage one of those? The limited amount of Andrew's lobster is in high demand. Before 9am, it's almost sold out. Have you got many lobsters left? No, we've not been enough left to last today. Oh, right. No, they've all they... been ordered. All of them? Nearly all of them. We've got eight there, maybe another 20 just out the pot. And that's it? That's it. Speaks volumes, doesn't it? Our success. For the last three years, Sue has committed to buy all of Andrew's lobsters and almost everything else he catches. You can't tap, it's too much money. Oh dear. <laughs> the lobsters took you over the edge. <laughs> yeah, go on. I don't negotiate with Andrew. For his lobsters, I pay market price, especially at this time of year. So what I would buy them through a wholesaler for, that's what I'm paying him. By working direct with a retailer, Andrew gets up to 25% more than by selling to a local wholesaler. Yeah, I have to catch the fish. I have to speak to Sue two or three times a week. Then I have to pack it. That's the stuff that people don't see. But at the end of the day, it works. I'm glad you like it. Take care. Whilst there's high demand from Sue's customers, the fishing is going to have to improve soon if it's to be a successful season for Andrew. Thank you. No, thank you. Yeah, I will do. I will do. Lundy, west, back and south, five or six. Showers, good. Fastnet, west backing south 5 or 6, increasing 7 or gear late later, showers, rain later, good occasion. Quite big stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it is rolling in heavy, isn't it? I'd say this time it's actually made more than what they forecast. Heavy Atlantic swell means Ben and his mate Nick are stuck ashore. go out on a poor day where everyone else is saying, oh, I don't think I'm going to go, it's not very good. If you come in with a boat full of fish, you know, you look great. Oh, brilliant. Look at him, what a hero. But that is right on a very fine line. If it went the other way, you know, it's game over, isn't it? And you look a complete fool and you quite likely lost your boat, if not your life. The battle with small boats is having the fine weather to get out so you can spend your time at sea, you know, anything more than six foot, really. They're struggling to launch down here off the beach. The days of thinking you're invincible are kind of over as soon as you have a kid. I think yeah. I'm sure Nick would agree. Sort of your priorities change and <clears throat> you know the, the consequences completely change. It's never worth it, not for a box of pollock or a few lobsters with what you've got at home. We're renting this place. Um, we're very lucky to have it. It's perfect location, two minutes from the cove. It was an affordable housing scheme, and we put our name down in 2010, 2011, and uh, we we're lucky enough to get the place with our local connection. And it's been a godsend, really, isn't it? It's been perfect. Ben grew up down the cove, but today, Senan is nearly all second homes and holiday lets. To actually go and have to buy a house in Senan would be, well, be a nightmare, really. The way they're snapped up so quickly, it's a bit like Millionaire's Row down there, really, anywhere, anywhere near the cove. Oh. OK. That's your pasta boiling over. Fishing's been a bit slow, so we've uh, 
decided to have a, a garden feature with uh, lobster pots this year. Yeah. I'd rather they were in the sea. Yeah, true. <laughs> you remind me of that quite often, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is my little one, Joseph. He's just over two now. Yeah, he's, he's a hungry two-year-old, aren't you? Are you going to be a fisherman? You want to drive tractors? Well, that's all right. That's better than fishing, isn't it? More money in farming, I think. But tractors. You like tractors. Well, you do that then. When Ben's father started fishing in the 70s, Sanon's fleet was twice the size. There isn't many uh, deciding to go fishing these days, and it's difficult to blame them, really. One thing a youngster these days needs, especially if they're looking to buy a house or even rent a house, is steady money coming in, and fishing doesn't guarantee that. Joseph, do you have to throw it all on the floor? That's where the dog comes into play. It's not just the weather that's frustrating Ben. He's growing worried that mackerel, which once made up over half his income, have not yet arrived. We didn't catch a mackerel last year of any amount until June, July, end of June, early July. So, you know, that, that's a big change when you think we used to start catching them end of March. It's a real string to your bow that's been taken away from us. It does concern me. I mean, if he stops working, then we're not going to have anything to live off. I mean, mm. it'd be difficult, wouldn't it? Money can be tight for small boat fishermen. The average take-home pay is under 20 grand. Sometimes when you think areas are getting overfished or the prices are rubbish and people say, oh, stop moaning, stop moaning, you're always moaning, you think, well, yeah, but it is my living. And it isn't a case of making a few quid there. It's, it's solely what we live off, isn't it? Mm. And it's not just me, it's not just you, it's Joseph as well, and it's keeping the house going. Mm. Yeah, it's the whole shebang. I'll do, the, I'll do the diesel if you do everything else. Fishing from the Helford brings big advantages. Well, we're very fortunate in that we're sheltered from westerly gales, southwest gales, we're protected, and northwest. So anything gale force from that quarter, we can still creep out around the coast here and make a living. Here. Chris, at 71, may be an old sea dog, but he's constantly up to new tricks. We're heading for a good year. I'm confident that if we carry on like we are, we'll, uh, we'll have the best year ever. You know. Now I've said that, it'll all go pear shape, I expect. <laughs> Chris sells most of his fish direct to high end sushi restaurants in London. With freshness critical, what he catches today needs to be landed and couriered to London this afternoon. These nets are for red mullet, and we're a little bit late. It's already daylight. We like to shoot them in the dark, really, but uh, we'll catch a few things. Chris is not catching to order. His customers demand quality above all else. Many of our customers want a variety of fish. To do that, we were at five different types of nets. We tend to emphasize the uh, type of net on the type of fish which is most readily available, and then we skew our markets to adapt to that type of uh, catch. But, you know, there, a, a typical landing has got 30 different species on it. The thing about these nets is they'll always come up with something. You know, if we hadn't got all this crab, we'd have a lot more flatfish. Uh, and if there's a lot of flatfish, there's no crab, so you, you, it all bounces out. Chris's crew are not exactly local. Chino's from Ecuador, and Evo is from Eastern Europe. I'm Bulgarian, but uh, there is not a lot of fish there. How many Bulgarian fishermen in, in Cornwall, Evo? Maybe I'm the first, who knows? Are there any more? Must be more, yeah. I heard there is lots of Lithuanians. Lithuanians, plenty of Lithuanians, but... Bulgarian, I don't think there's that many. Here you are, nearly got it there. I was gas engineer, plumber, for quite a few years. 
good money, you know, but I didn't like it. I didn't like it. Too much stress, too much stress. And I was feeling like a mouse in the rat race, you know, it's so I met Chris on the fish market. And one day I said, why, why I don't try as a fisherman? I love that. And I went, I spoke to him. He said, I, I, need, I need a guy. You can try. I said, I don't try. I, I'm doing the thing. Who have this working place? Nobody else. Only us, the fishermen, the sailors. Lovely, great creatures, aren't they? Chris believes the waters around here are so rich, due in part to EU fishing quotas limiting catches. Look at these fish coming up here. Now. The abundance of the ocean. Well, I think the stock levels are high, according to the scientists. On most species, they've been increasing for about 10 years. And I'm, it's got to be something to do with um, these tight restrictions that have been put on fishing by EU regulations and tight quotas and the closed fishing areas, this type of thing. It's estimated that over 90% of fishermen voted to leave the EU. Chris voted to remain, but he has some sympathy with those who wanted out. 20 to 30 French trawlers fishing on the six mile limit. That never seems right, you know? I can understand local fishermen looking at them. And to be fair, those French trawlers are high capacity catching boats. And what they're catching out there is not gonna come in here for us, is it? Why should we allow somebody not from this country to control the borders and the rules? And why the UK doesn't control them? And this is what I, you know, why some bureaucratic system far away should tell us what to do? We have to remember that the, the main market for our fish is Europe. So if those, if those markets suddenly got closed, there would, be a, there would be a major issue, you know. That's it. We're finished now. We'll go on. You will expect that I'm against Brexit, but I'll tell you, my opinion is the Brexit in long term 10, 20 years from now is the best choice. UK has always been an uh, island, and it's been like, uh, how, how can I say, free from the rest of the world, in, and should stay free. And, you know, to be able to control their borders and the economy, the fishing industry, everything, everything. Chris and Evo have caught over 20 species today. Yeah, it's good all round bit of fishing, really. Yeah. They now have to land and process the fish quickly to send them to Chris's high-end clients in London. For 13 years, we were all over the shop. Brixham, up in Wales, and all that. Our boat, um, we were fishing up Brixham on the lemon soles then. For some fishermen, resentment towards the EU is personal. Back in the 80s, Andrew owned a trawler. It got tough because plenty of fish to be caught and we weren't allowed to catch the cod or haddock or one another, so in the end we took decommissioning. EU quotas and landing bans made Andrew's boat unviable. So he reluctantly gave it up to a government programme aimed at reducing fishing capacity. The government came in and gave us some money to chop our boat up, so we had it broken up with a digger. Um, 13 years down the line, we came out no better off than what we was. Because we didn't reinvest again into the fishing industry, we were hit with capital gains, so we had to pay them a load of money as well. But it was a case of we had wives looking at, you know, mortgages and the boat to pay for and all sorts. It was up to the hilt with bloody financial struggles, really. 
our government don't look after us, and I can see Brexit, we will be used as a bargaining chip again, because all the EU nations come around the British Isles to fish. I haven't got an issue with the French coming here, the Spanish coming here, or whoever comes here, the Belgians, but if they're allowed five tonne, we should be allowed five tonne. When we're stopped, everybody should be stopped. If there's a fair playing field, I haven't got an issue with that, but when we're stopped and other nations are carrying on plundering in our back garden, that's where it's wrong. The mackerel still haven't arrived, and the lobsters have been poor. So when the weather's allowed Ben to get out, he's been after Pollock. If you sit still, you're going backwards in fishing. If you aren't catching anything, you're going backwards rapidly. So if things aren't uh, producing, you've got to look elsewhere. It's no good just trying to do the same thing every day. Fishing with a hand line is highly sustainable. With a hand line, you're only catching what is feeding on the day, so you're catching a very small percentage of what's actually there. As opposed to nets, I suppose you're catching everything. That's a pollock. Feels like a good one. Six pounder. It's become more popular, certainly the last 10, 15 years. With a lack of mackerel, a lot of people have turned to the pollock as an alternative, but uh, our stocks seem to be holding up. Big boy. Beauty. He's probably three and a half kilo. Cracking pollock. More of the same, please. As a small boat, you know, what we've got over the, the larger boats is the fact that we're catching fish on the day and, you know, at, at very most, they're 24 hours old when they're, when they're being sold on the market. So that's what we're standing behind is the fresh fish, the traceability, the, the fact that they're well looked after. And it's a, it's a great product that we're, uh, that we're backing, really. You have to maximise the quality. Obviously, because you don't catch vast quantities, what little bit you do catch, you have to look after. As an inshore fisherman, limited by the weather and the size of his boat, Ben needs to maximise the value of everything he catches. These tags mean that uh, the buyers can go online to see which boat caught the fish. So, if you look, it's got a number 22 there, which is my vessel. You can find where it was caught and how it was caught. It should reflect in the price. See a better, better dollar. The cabinet has agreed in principle to a sweeping overhaul of the UK's immigration system after Brexit, which would see migrants from the European Union treated the same as those from the rest of the world. A report by the government's migration advisers last week recommended that skills... In Chris Bean's wholesale business, supplying top London sushi restaurants, quality is everything. 2.3. We're grading and weighing in the fish. Get it on the board, then they can photograph it and sell it. Clients can view photos online and buy fish individually. The prime fish will catch this courier at the top of the lane. Lives at quarter past four. To meet the courier's strict daily afternoon deadline, the business depends on a reliable workforce. I don't think that most of the fish processing business can survive without foreign labour. I've got the guy from Bulgaria, we've got a Spaniard, we've got a Greek, we've got a Lithuanian. If, you, if you're going to go this Brexit route and say, OK, we're going to control immigration and completely, we'll just have, you know, pick and cherry pick, it's not going to work. 13.6. There's seven kilos of red money. Anything that doesn't pay more than £10 an hour or £15 an hour is going to be filled with uh, cheaper labour from outside of, the, of uh, England, outside of Britain. And, you know, that's a fact, whether you like it or not. Yeah. Right, that's it. Now we can go home.
If I was entitled to vote, I would vote for Brexit again. People would say, oh, you are a traitor to the East Europeans, but my brain is telling me that I'm 18 years in UK. This is like my country already. The number of EU citizens coming to the UK to work has continued to fall since the Brexit referendum. So yeah, this is my home at the moment. Lovely place. It's a typical caravan place, you know. My family, they went back in uh, our home country, which is Bulgaria. And uh, she decided to stay there because her father is not well. I thought Korno is the best place for us, but she, she wants there. When I came, I was welcomed from the local people, but I think with, with the European Union and the free movement of people, too many people came who are not uh, helping the economy. With his wife back in Bulgaria, Ivo is joining a growing number of EU citizens who are also returning home. I'm going back to my country, but I feel like British, you know, because I, I was contributing all the time, I was trying to do good things. Like it, isn't it? Three there. That's what we like to see. Off Senan Cove, the lobsters have at last started to find the pots. Yeah, nice improvement on last time. It couldn't get much worse, really, could it? This is what we're after. Nice lobster. Beauty. Woo! One, two in there. Average in about one lobster a pot, which is which is what we look for, especially this time of year. So, yeah, started well today. So hopefully it continues. Warming waters mean the fish are now moving. The lobstermen can finally start making some decent money. Well, I didn't about to start. Oh, ideal. Three to start. That's a bonus. To keep up with demand at Sue's shop in Surrey, Andrew needs to check over 100 of his pots today. I like being 100 miles an hour. Old people go slow. I don't categorise myself as that yet. Oh, dear. One or two here, skipper. Quite happy with that little shot. Four Camberley lobsters for my mate. Despite turning 60 this summer, Andrew still prefers to work his pots alone. Yes, I ain't too enamoured with the growing old malarkey. To be quite honest, if I couldn't come out here catching fish, I'd rather be dead. Because I definitely don't want to be in a bloody home on a Zimmer frame, that's for sure. I ain't going to retire, I'm just going to fish and then die. Lobsters in every pot, yahoo! Oh, that's a fine fish. That's about the biggest one for the year. Jump this and then we're home. Andrew's working day is not done yet. He must now package his lobsters for the courier to Camberley. This is the second order this week. This catch travels first class. Yeah, we put these frozen gel packs in the bottom. And the seaweed is nice and cold. Where Sue's shop is, there's a lot of um, high-end customers up there. Well, if they're paying top dollar, they want stuff that's all alive and we do our best to look after her and look after these you know they're beautiful fish finally andrew turns to social media to help sue sell them i've just got to send a picture off to twitter a minute to say that the lobsters will be in sue's shop for the morning it gives them a heads up that lobsters are coming 
So the rich and generous people of Camberley will be there tomorrow to buy our lobsters, won't they? There we go, sent. Done. There we are, all snug. They'll be there in a shop. Five o'clock tomorrow morning. Thank you, sir. Cheers. That's it. Job done. Well, Alexa, today I'm just messing around. I don't know what to do pass away the time, you know? I'd rather be out there. Around Cornwall, the lobster potting is now good, but conditions won't allow the boats from Penberth to go to sea. Down at the cove, we are pretty limited with the weather. If we get too much ground sea or too much waves coming in on the slip, then we can't push off in that. You just you risk a boat too much. He's a mate more than a, a son. Yeah, we do most things together. My wife got fed up with me and the kids in married life. And she decided to leave one day and never come back. James was eight. I'd done a bit of fishing, done the cooking and the cleaning. Ah, oh, we managed. Yeah, we got on all right. You'd think that dog was mine, wouldn't you? <laughs> He's another one, he gets bored as well. When the weather's poor, James has to fall back on his other job, working as a shipwright. When I finished school, I was told to go and get a trade before I went fishing. So this was as close to working on boats as I could get. Good money now and then, and pay the bills up. Today, he's helping replace a deck on an aging trawler in Newland. Much rather be out on the water. But you can't always get out where I am, and not always the fish around to pay the bills. Whereas this is a money every week, you know what you're going to earn. So it's a bit more reliable. A lot of people had jobs, and when they left work, they went fishing in the evenings. That's what made the cove. If it wasn't for all these people about 30, 40 years ago, we wouldn't have a cove now. Like many coves across Cornwall, Penberth used to be a thriving community, the slipway packed with boats. It's very much not unchanged from 50 years ago, possibly even 100 years ago, to, to look at, which is lovely in a lot of respects, but you could argue it's been left behind and is, is one of the reasons it's going to uh, fold potentially in the future, which would be extremely sad, obviously. I don't know, it used to be 14, 15 boats, something like that. I can't remember them all. Well, I would, if I sat down, I remember all the names, but it used, to, it used to be two rows of boats there then. And uh, it didn't matter if you were here first or not, uh, if your boat was in the way, you had to go first. Whether it lasts another five years or 10 years or 20 years is, well, it's a bit up in the air, really. It'd be nice to think it would go on for a lot longer yet. Hopefully I'll retire eventually down there in a few years time anyway. I'll keep going as long as I can. James keep on saying, what. Well, what pot should we have next year? And next year, <laughs> in the middle of the summer, I'm going to be 81, so whether I'll be still here then, I don't know. That is the problem. Very warm 
warm today with plenty of sunshine, highs of 24 Celsius, muggy and close tonight and turning quite breezy with lows down to 14 Celsius. And for Friday, another great day with wall-to-wall -wall sunshine. A hedgehog is making the news. Why? I'll tell you. It's high summer. The tourists are here en masse. If only the same could be said about the mackerel. The way the trend's going, it's only getting worse. And that's, that's what really bothers me, the fact that progressively over the last five years, it's got later and later every year and probably less and less actual fish when they do turn up. The reasons for the mackerel's late arrival are hotly debated. I'm sure it's down to global warming. Because they're catching mackerel now in Greenland and Iceland. They've never, ever had them there before. So where have they come from? You know, they haven't just, just appeared all of a sudden. They've come from somewhere. And as they say, fish have got tails and they swim. It's all supposition, isn't it? But there's a huge effort by massive ships registered in the UK and Holland. They catch more mackerel in one day than the handline boats would catch over here. But you can it's not an infinite resource. So you can't have them west of Ireland catching tons and tons and tons and expect them to turn up every year all the same. So that's my view. Everyone's now pollocking because there's no mackerel, which obviously has a knock-on effect on the, on the pollock stocks. And you do wonder if it can sustain that kind of pressure over and over and over again, the same spots. But it uh, remains to be seen. Hopefully it will, but uh, I have my doubts. Campaigners for a new referendum on the terms of any Brexit deal have explained how they believe it could happen, despite the Prime Minister ruling it out. The People's Vote group argues that MPs could amend a motion approving a deal or legislation implementing it to make it subject to a new public vote. The country voted to leave, so our government need to get on with it and sort it. All these Remainers and one another, well, sorry, chaps, but you guys lost. Once again, very warm welcome on board. Scrapman to railways, 745 departure from Plymouth to London, Paddington. Six months to Brexit. Well, I can't see many changes happening in the meantime. I don't know, really. We have to see what happens. With Brexit just months away, Chris is heading to London for a meeting of the Coastal Producer Organization a group that lobbies government on behalf of small boat fishermen. I have a feeling that the, uh, the French will operate a tit-for-tat um, vendetta against the, uh, the fishing sector. I, I just cannot imagine that all these French trawlers that we see on the six-mile limit within sight of Cornwall, I just cannot imagine that they're going to uh, disappear to the other side of the channel and fish there. But yeah, I am worried about it. I, I mean, I voted to remain because I could see these issues confronting us. Despite making up 80% of the UK fleet, our small boats are only entitled to catch less than 5% of the UK's quota. Brexit could offer an opportunity to redress that balance. Because of the very nature, really, of a, of a small, small vessel fleet, they're vulnerable to weather, they're vulnerable to markets. And uh, I would like to campaign for the small vessels to have as much fish as they can possibly catch. I don't think anybody knows what the hell Brexit is going to do to the fishing industry. Everybody's hoping it's going to be really good, but I can see our spineless government basically using the fishing, the fishermen and the fishing as a bargaining chip, as they have done for numerous years. <sighs> Sorry, I'm late. Most inshore fishermen voted for Brexit, hoping it would make things better. So the B word, Brexit, we responded uh, individually and collectively to the consultation on the white paper for the fisheries bill. We've made it very clear um, to DEFRA, to the minister, to Mr Gove, face to face, that this is a one-off, a unique opportunity to really rebalance the whole quota equation. The whole fisheries 
Christie's main concern is continued access to European markets for British fish. If there's a hard Brexit and if our shellfish is going to have tariffs put on it to be exported into Spain or France, what is that tariff going to be? Are we talking about 2% or 25%? No. Or? Well, I recall it was around 10 or 12%, but I could yeah. be wrong. Because this is what is going to have to be absorbed by our shellfish industry, our, our catchers. It is one of the dangers, but then we put up our barriers. Are the French going to stockpile their Renaults and their Citrons? So, looking at it from a fisherman's point of view, they have our fish, we'll have their cars, they'll have a bit of this, we'll have a bit of that, and we... on we go. And we're not hearing anything, ah, oh, right, OK, so we heard what your, what your concerns were, and this is what... There's concern that if the French fleet are forced out of UK waters, their fishermen will take matters into their own hands. The French who admit well over 60% of their landings come from UK territorial waters. Ostensibly, as Mr Gove says, we will become an independent coastal state and take back control on 2019. And a lot of people hope that, that would mean that we kick them out, we get the fish, we get the quota, and uh, we get this massive one-off windfall, which would rejuvenate especially the under 10 metre fleet. None of the European countries are going to take that lying down, so we do have to face the issue that if that goes to plan, then there's likely to be some resistance at a port level. Um, I mean, the, the, the recent so-called scallop wars were a case in point where French fishermen um, got a little overexcited and started throwing flares and bolts and shackles about. The news is crowded over with... Uh... You know, what's going to happen to our exports? Well, we have to have visas to go to France. And so all these other things that have been brought up by uh, uh, what will happen if we leave yeah, that were, were never actually presented uh, to, the, uh, to the voters, especially to the fishermen, uh, at, at the point of uh, the referendum. I just worry that people weren't completely informed both ways of how they were voting and... It's going to be very interesting to see what happens because there seems to be such an unknown factor with it all that I don't think anyone can stand here and say, well, that's good, that's positive, or that's negative. I think it's a completely unknown quantity and it's going to be an interesting few years, I think, for sure. I don't know what I'm doing from one day to the next at times. These mackerel turned up the last day or two on the tide, so I shall fish them. It's late summer. After months of waiting, the mackerel have finally arrived. The prices aren't nothing brilliant because there's mackerel everywhere. So hopefully if I can catch a few more over the next day or two, I'll be well happy with that. Look, unbelievable. Don't want these. Oh, little ones, go away, children. Come back again another day. I don't want anything smaller than that, really. Ben is also on the hunt. The way the prices are, for two of us, really, we want a couple hundred kilo today. They'll give us a good morning's work, so... Aim for 200 kilos, something like that. Just looking for a few marks and a sounder. It's a good mark there now, actually. We'll try that. Fish there straight away in. Here they are. This is quite an antiquated way of fishing, really. I think this way of fishing would last forever. We used to catch hundreds and hundreds of stones of them when I was a youngster. Fish all day. Boats have got bigger, fishing has got more efficient. Whereas you catch a few boxes, bigger boats catch tons and tons, but there we go. It's the way the cookie crumbles nowadays. That's a bit better. That's better. Oh, 
like we got a decent morning's work there. Probably 150 of mackerel and nice box of bait there, which obviously helps. Every small mackerel there is a lobster. That's the way I try and look at it. I reckon that's that, mate. Yeah. Things are even looking up in Penberth. They're good mackerel. The ones we've been catching, they aren't so many, but they're bigger. Well, they were. Oh, we got a seal, seal here. Look. Straight away. Seals are taking the fish. Look. You're pulling them off. Have a nice line full and then they're gone. It's a darn nuisance. He comes right alongside and takes the fish off the hooks. Ah. Ah. Well, it's dangerous to put the hooks in your hands. I ain't got no one, James. Look, look. Right. Ah. That was lucky. I just pulled the hook out of my finger. What a stick of dino up his, up his ass. When the seal has had his fill, James and Michael are finally left to catch a few for themselves. A struggle, wasn't it? A struggle to get those filled. If the weather allows them to get out, the mackerel should see them through till the end of the year. Yeah, I always enjoy it. There's no point in coming out here if we don't enjoy it. Yeah, we might have had some fantastic weather this summer. I hope to go out here again next year, but you never know. Hey, you going that way? Should we go a bit faster? No, head to the harbour. What do you want to catch? Squid. Squid. Pressure is on now. I've got to try and catch some squid. Obviously, Dad was a fisherman, and I caught the bug from him. We're hoping that Joseph catches it as well. Might have a little fisherman on our hands after all. When autumn storms roll in, size really matters. It's a big trip for a young skipper in training. It does get a bit daunting up here. While some boats compete with our neighbours. Basically, mate, this French keys up. I'm not listening. On others, they're part of the crew. I work here because I'm a fisherman. If you would like to find out more about the UK's fishing industry and how it's changing, the Open University has produced a free poster. Order your copy by calling 0300 303 3827 or go to bbc.co.uk forward slash fishing life and follow the links to the Open University.